This time on Monkey Life. Alison is in Vietnam to release two golden-cheeked gibbons back into the wild. We're just a short trek now away from the release site. So far, so good, and they're looking good. But there's trouble when a rival male appears on the scene. We've just heard a big crash. It could be Limwin. I don't know. They're all chasing around, but we'll go and see. Down, but not out. Will Limwin manage to find his mate, Misu, again? This is Dao Tien Rescue Center in Vietnam. It's the sister sanctuary of Monkey World in Dorset. And the staff here dedicate their lives to rescuing and rehabilitating endangered Vietnamese primates. We got him. All good. Our team are brilliant. Alison has traveled 6,000 miles from the UK to visit the center, which lies 160 miles northeast of the capital, Ho Chi Minh City. Vietnam is one of the most densely populated countries in Southeast Asia. Monkey World decided to open a center here because, outside of its bustling cities, it's rich in exotic species, but struggles with the illegal trade in wildlife. Alison makes regular trips to Vietnam, but this time she's brought along wildlife vet John Lewis. It's five years now since we've been working um, in southern Vietnam, and it's time to sit down and take stock, really. We've rehabilitated and released pygmy loris, black shank duke langers, and golden cheek gibbons, and after five years, it's really, we need to look at our success and our failures, because there's been a little bit of both. So it's time to make a plan for the next five years. The rescue center lies within Cat Tien National Park. The only way to get to it is by boat, as it's based on an island surrounded by the Dong Nai River. The current manager of the center is Lee Butler. Good to see you, long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> Unlike Monkey World, Dao Tien does not provide a home for rescued animals for the rest of their lives. It's very much a halfway house. Their ideal scenario is to release them back into the wild, although this isn't always possible. The question is, should we have him down and do a proper health check? Well, I know. Yeah. It's straight down to business. Alison wants to make the most of the limited time she has here. But during the afternoon, the inevitable heavy rain clouds gather bringing an abrupt end to their first day's work on the island. Most of the primates which pass through Dao Tien are golden-cheeked gibbons. Today, the team wants to carry out health checks on a female called Ni and a young male called Bin, who's recently arrived at the center. Health checks for these gibbons are extremely important, particularly when they first come into the center. Often they've been held as a pet, or perhaps in circus, and they would have been exposed, or potentially exposed, to a lot of human diseases, which can impact on their health. So the first thing we do is check them to see if they have contracted any human disease, like tuberculosis, for example. And there are other things we need to do, like put microchips in them to uniquely identify them. And there may be specific tests for animals with particular problems that we want to investigate. Bin is up first, and Lee has been given the job of injecting him. Bin knows Lee, so is more likely to cooperate. This should be a relatively smooth operation, but we need to stay back and be calm and quiet as to not upset him. <laughs> Lee hangs a net in the enclosure to break Bin's fall when the drugs begin to take effect. As soon as he's down, John takes over. This is the first time they've been able to properly examine Bin. He was confiscated by the Forestry Protection Department after being held illegally. The canines are good. Body condition good? So far. 
Bin seems to be in good health. John is putting a microchip under Bin's skin so he can be identified in the future. He's also taking some bloods so he can carry out some routine tests. And weighing the primates is important to monitor their progress. 6.9. 6.9 kilos is a good weight for a gibbon of Bin's age. One down, one to go. This is knee, female knee, and she's just going to have some bloods taken and a birth control implant. But once knee is on the table, the team hits problems. She's overheating. 62, 63 heart rate. It's extremely warm. We're sort of middle of the day. You give them an anesthetic, they're unable to regulate their temperature, can shoot through the roof, and you immediately go into really big medical problems if they overheat. So it's absolutely critical that we monitor their body temperature, their blood pressure, their heart rate. 38.7. Knee's temperature begins to fall, so the team plows on. OK, blood, so implant. Some of the female gibbons are given contraceptive implants because the team doesn't want them to have any more babies unless they're being released into the wild. They want youngsters to grow up in the forest, not in captivity. As well as golden-cheeked gibbons, Gautian also looks after two other native species, black-shanked duklangers and pygmy loris. During her many visits to Vietnam, Alison has observed the illegal trade in pygmy loris firsthand. Most are stolen from forests, either for the pet trade or they're killed and their body parts are used in traditional medicine. Baby Huai is the latest loris to end up at Dao Tien. He's just 15 weeks old. His mother came to us as a victim of the pet trade. Um, we know she was a victim of the pet trade because her teeth had been removed, which is quite common for pet trade loris because they have a venomous bite. And so she came in pregnant and gave birth to little Huai with one other infant. Sadly, Thor, the mother, and the other infant died. We think predator attack. So sadly, little one here is having to be hand-reared, but is doing really well under the circumstances. He's very strong. He's got a very feisty little personality. And, um, yeah, fingers crossed. The team at Dao Tien regularly patrols the island, looking for snakes and other predators. But they're being extra vigilant at the moment, as there seem to be more than usual. A monitor lizard could easily take out a loris. Heavy rain showers are part of life in Vietnam, and the team has to work through them. Lee and John are on their way to a city called Binh Hoa, with two golden-cheeked gibbons who need x-rays. Dao Tien doesn't have the specialist equipment needed to do them. Eight-year-old Ellie has been at the center for four years. Recently, the staff have noticed she's having a problem with her back and want to find out why. They're also taking a young male gibbon who was riddled with gunshot pellets when he arrived at the center. They need to know if any remaining pellets are either too close to or have damaged any of his major organs. After a three hour drive, they arrive in Bin Hoa. And while Lee checks on the patients, John prepares the anesthetic. Ellie is of particular concern to John. Since being in the centre, she's developed a, a profound curvature of the spine. So we want to know what's happened to the bones. And it's difficult without some sort of imaging to identify the exact problem simply by examining her clinically. So we're going for x-ray to start with. For speed, John uses a blowpipe. And she's soon asleep. They need to place Ellie carefully to make sure they get the best view of her back on the X-ray. It doesn't take long for the Vietnamese technicians to produce the images. OK, let's have a look. The curvature is extreme. There's a kink, for want of a better expression here. I'm not sufficient of an orthopedic 
specialist to tell you what's caused that, although for me that looks dramatic. Some trauma, some fall or whatever. But what's surprising with that degree of spinal deformity that there aren't neurological problems further down because you'd expect some degree of spinal cord damage to go along with that degree of um, spinal damage. So it is still curious and I'd like to refer that for a, a better opinion than mine. Once Ellie is safely awake, all eyes fall on the little male called Tien. The X-ray will help John decide whether he needs to operate to remove the gunshot pellets. Three pellets, I think it was, were removed from just under the skin when it came in. But as you can see, these white spots are lead shot. So there's another six shot particles in the body. Now, that may not cause a problem. And if they're not surgically very accessible, and the gibbon is behaving normally, I would leave that alone. The only issue would be whether those pellets had damaged some vital structure. And that we can determine clinically. So with Ellie and Jian carefully back in their traveling crates, John and Lee head back to Dao Tien. Coming up, it's a big day for golden cheeked gibbons Misu and Limwin as preparations are made for their release. Fingers crossed for Limwin and Misu. It's been a long way to get them here. But the team is on tenterhooks when a rival male appears out of nowhere to challenge Limwin. He's got to get his act together and get back up into the trees and get strong. Otherwise, we can't leave him out here. Since Monkey World's sister sanctuary Dao Tien opened five years ago, the team has managed to release two family groups of golden-cheeked gibbons back into the wild, as well as 15 pygmy loris and four black-shanked duglangers who are now breeding. Releases are always fraught with danger, as the wild is not an easy place for these animals to live. But the staff do a huge amount of research to make sure the places they choose to set the primates free are as safe as possible. It's been a difficult but rewarding journey for the team. Dao Tien, as its name is, means Angel Island, was just that for us. Um, it was a godsend because it ticked all of those boxes we needed in order to get these primates rehabilitated and back out into the wild. Today, two more gibbons are going to be released in the National Park. They've been at Dao Tien for four years after being confiscated by authorities in an amusement park. Both the female Misu and the male Limwin were originally stolen from the wild as infants, and staff believe they're now ready to be set free again. Really can't wait to see yet another pair that I've known since they were quite young going back out into the wild. It's just fantastic. It's what this whole project is about. Misu and Limwin have been living in a semi-free area at Dao Tien for the last 18 months to prepare them for the big moment, and so have already had to fend for themselves to a certain extent. We're just a short trek now away from the release site, so we'll get the gibbons quietly, gently off of the truck, out to the release site and into their holding pen, where they'll stay for the day overnight, and tomorrow's the big day, so, so far so good. Cat Tien is a lot safer for wildlife than most national parks in Vietnam because they have more trained forest rangers there who are known as the Kim Lam. The team at Dao Tien, along with Mr. Bin and other Kim Lam, has chosen a site which has good strong trees for the gibbons to swing through and plenty of fruiting trees so they have enough food. They've also done surveys to make sure there are no other gibbons in the area as they're fiercely territorial. Yes. Ah, fruits that Mr. Ben has just picked up are boa fruit, which is one of the main feed items for the, the wild gibbons. So he's picked a few up and we'll give them to the gibbons now. So it's fantastic. Misu is released into the holding pen first. Closely followed by Limwin. The team needs to keep them as calm as possible. The 
pair of them really are coping with the move and their release into that cage, that release cage, extraordinarily well. So I would have thought they were good to go tomorrow. The fact that they're eating is a good sign, as it means they're not too stressed. The team always put tracking collars on their rehabilitated gibbons so they can monitor them. This is the direction where you should point. Dr. Curtis Pei, who helped to set up Dao Tien, has flown in from Taiwan to advise Mr. Bin and the Kim Lam, who will follow the gibbons in the months to come. Ah, strong. Once Misu and Limwin are settled, they're left alone to adjust to the new smells and sounds around them. The team likes to do releases in the morning to allow the gibbons plenty of time to get to know their surroundings before nightfall. Misu and Limwin are waiting expectantly when they arrive. This morning, they will have been given a little bit of food inside of the cage, but really what we want them to do is to come out and start going after the wild fruits in the area because we know that this is a really good quality of forest and there's plenty of food out there for them. So um, we've got a few people here to be following them today and we'll just have to see how we go. But fingers crossed for Limwin and Misu. It's been a long way to get them here. The Kim Lam work closely with Dao Tien and play a vital role in these releases. So Mr. Bin is given the honor of setting the gibbons free. Misu lets Limwin take the lead. Day, you know, it's pretty huge. And what's great is that Limwin and Misu have gone up into the trees and haven't even looked back at us. I think we've got all of the boxes ticked and just really pleased for them. And now I think it's time for all of us to leave because we're noisy and awkward and it just distracts them. And we'll come back tomorrow morning get out the telemetry gear and see how far they've traveled, if at all. So, really good day. Next morning, the team returns to the release site armed with the radio transmitter to check on Misu and Limwin. And they hear them calling. This is it. That's them calling. They spot the two gibbons high in the canopy. But then suddenly, another male appears and starts to chase Limwin. I don't know, I think we've just heard a big crash. It could be Limwin, I don't know, they're all chasing around, but we'll go and see. It looks like the site may just be on the edge of another gibbon's territory, and that's bad news. They spot Limwin on the floor and now have to make the difficult decision as to whether to intervene. It's possible the other male is trying to pair up with Misu. We've got Limwin down on the ground, which for Gibbon is always a bad sign. We just need to know right now that actually he's physically fit and I'm not entirely sure. They decide they have to try to help Limwin. But he starts moving. He's up. We back off. Back off. Hello, my friend. Limwin seems OK, just a little shell-shocked. I think he's healthy, but he's only staying at this height and he's frightened. We've got to stand off right now between Limwin and the rival male that was, came into the area this morning. 
I'm once down low on the ground. Misu's left, probably waiting to see which male's going to be the winner. Um, and we just now need to make sure that Limwin can find himself a place up off of the ground. We can't leave him here down low. He won't survive. So tense time right now. And he's fit and he's healthy. But he's terrified and staying down really low. So we're going to have to work on this and monitor this for a bit. Limwin bolts away, but he's staying low. As he heads deeper into the forest, the team tries to track him using the transmitter. There he is. It's very possible that the rival male has returned to his territory and his female. We don't know for sure. We do know for sure with the radio collars that Limwin's still over in the trees here, not terribly high, and that Misu's up the road this way. He's got to get his act together and get back up into the trees and get strong, otherwise we can't leave him out here. Limwin and Misu's future is not guaranteed. Only time will tell whether the rival male will be successful and take Misu away as his mate. The wild is wonderful and the best place for gibbons, but it's not always the safest option. Next time on Monkey Life... Morning, Jim. Alison goes to the rescue of four more marmosets in Cheshire, but all is not what it seems. I think we definitely have two different species here. And it's all change at the Orang Nursery to make way for an orphaned baby from Hungary.